Okay, let's pray. Lord, would you continue to tune our hearts and give us ears to hear and hearts to receive all that you'd say to us in these next moments. Lord, I don't know, but that what you're going to give something here to one of these women that she doesn't realize how much she'll need it tomorrow or next week or maybe someone who desperately needs it today. And so we just ask that by your spirit you would minister tailor-made grace to each of us through the power of your word. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. I read a book not too long ago by Richard Swenson called The Overload Syndrome. People pick up that book when they're already in overload and they don't know what to do. And uh, in that book, he talks about things like chronic activity overload. Isn't that a 21st century term? He talks about an unprecedented stress epidemic. And he says that most of America is in a hyper-stress environment. And isn't it true if you talk to women today and you say, how are you doing? The adjectives you'll hear are things like busy, too much going on, stressed, over, overwhelmed, overcommitted, and I think all of us know something about that lifestyle, probably too much. He has a chapter in that book called Hurry and Fatigue. And in that chapter he says, even our sentences are peppered with such words as time crunch, fast food, rush hour, frequent flyer, expressway, overnight delivery, and rapid transit. The products and services we use further attest to our hurry. We send packages by Federal Express, use a long-distance company called Sprint, manage our personal finances on Quicken, schedule our appointments on a day runner, diet with SlimFast, and swim in trunks made by Speedo. Well, probably not most of us. He says, we are plagued by this hurry sickness. We live in a nanosecond culture, wheezing and worn out. Americans are, if anything, exhausted. He says, we are a nation of the hardwired and dog-tired. Now, it'd be really funny if it weren't so true. And I find Christians in all seasons of life, all situations, all ages, I mean single, married, with children, few children, lots of children, empty nest, older, working outside the home, not working outside the home, involved in many different things. I just find this is way too common among us as Christians and certainly way too common a description of my own life. And that's why the Lord takes me back uh, to this Psalm 23, and it's such a help and an encouragement and sets perspective for me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Verse 2, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Or some of your translations say, he leads me beside waters of rest. Doesn't that just sound great? I wrote a book called A Place of Quiet Rest, and I've had very little rest ever since I wrote that book. (laughs) I'm telling you, and sometimes I find I need to go back and read that book, and I, I love the cover. I can't take any credit for this, but it's this beautiful, idyllic scene on the side of some really peaceful lake, and I just look at that picture, and I say, I don't know where that is, but I would love to be there. I love to go there. And I think of David saying in the Psalms, oh, that I had wings like a bird, then would I fly away and be at rest. I would hasten my escape from the windy storm and tempest. And we find ourselves caught up in these, in these tornadoes of activity, this frantic busyness, desperately needing these green pastures and to quiet our hearts at these waters of rest, these still waters. It talks about green pastures and still waters in this verse. And I think that's a reference to finding rest and refreshment for our hearts. And when your heart is rested and refreshed, then the rest of you will will be able to be rested and refreshed. The problem is we just focus on our bodies, and sometimes you can get your body rested and refreshed, but your heart isn't rested and refreshed, and you're still in turmoil. 
I'm so glad God cares about sanctifying us, body, soul, and spirit, all parts of us. But rest and refreshment. You know, we're talking about sheep and shepherds here. Before sheep can be productive, before they can provide wool and meat, they have to be healthy. They have to be mature. They have to be well-developed. But in our Christian lives, we tend to put productivity first and to just ignore our spiritual health and to say, you know what? Unhealthy or immature souls cannot be truly productive as God measures productivity. So we say, the Lord is my shepherd. He gives me lots to do. I've got a family to care for. I've got other people's needs to be met. I've got a job to do. I've got a class to teach. I've got work to do at my church. I've got this committee to be on and that committee to serve on and this place to go and this thing to do. And he uses me to win others to Christ and he makes me a good wife and a good mother and a good homemaker and he helps me get my work done. The Lord is my shepherd and I am out of breath. (laughs) That's not the mindset you see here, is it? No, first, the Lord is my shepherd He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Why? So we can get food and drink, refreshment, nourishment, before we try and go out and be productive. Many of you have been nursing moms at one time or another. And you know that a nursing mother has to be well-nourished herself before she can provide quality nourishment for her thirsty babe. And if the mom's diet isn't a healthy one, if you're eating too many spicy foods, you may end up with a colicky baby, right? You're going to give out what's been put into you. And that's what so many of us are doing and trying to minister to and disciple others. We're feeding them that frantic, frazzled, frustrated stuff we're living on and trying to nourish others when our own hearts are not nourished. Some of us are spiritually malnourished. We're trying to meet everyone else's needs, trying to provide nourishment to others, trying to be productive, but we're falling apart. We're burnt out. We're running on fumes. We have nothing to offer. But people today, and even within the church, sad to say, we tend to be impressed by busyness. How many activities you're involved in? How much you get done? I mean, in our 21st century world, it sounds kind of lazy, kind of unproductive to talk about lying down in green pastures. It's like somebody lives on a cruise ship or something, you know? I mean, it's get a life. And we're not impressed by that, hanging out by still waters. But I want to tell you, hurry is the enemy of spiritual intimacy. As you read the Gospels, you see the pattern of Jesus' life. One of the things that strikes us as we read them is that Jesus never seemed to be in a hurry. Now, it's not that he wasn't busy. You read in Mark chapter 1, one day in the life of Jesus is enough to wear you out reading about it, but Jesus doesn't seem stressed by it. He never seems to be in a hurry. You never read about him running. Now, I'm not saying he didn't, but isn't it interesting that God didn't think it was important enough, if he did, to put it in the Scripture? You do read about him walking. You read about him sitting at the well in the middle of the day. Get up, Jesus, it's time to work. What are you doing sitting down in the middle of the day, Mom? There's things to do. You read about him sitting. You read about him reclining at meals. You read about him sleeping in the boat when there's a storm going on and everybody is in a dither. What's Jesus doing? Sleeping. I mean, it's just kind of counterintuitive to the way we function. Do you think we could have been in that storm sleeping? I mean, even if you weren't afraid of the storm, what are we going to do? We're women. We're in charge. You know, we got to control things. We got to fix it. We got to find a way to settle the storm or to settle the people who are afraid in the storm. But you don't find that out of control, frantic Jesus. I'm going to tell you, hurry is not conducive to godliness. It's not conducive to relationships. It's not conducive to spiritual growth. It's not conducive to mothering. It's not conducive to being a good wife. It's not conducive to being fruitful in your church. It's not conducive to discipleship and relationships. You know with your children, you can't just schedule, okay, here's your 10 minutes discipleship time and ask me all your important questions, 13-year-old. 
When's a 13-year-old going to open up when you were least expecting it? Late at night when you're exhausted, right? That's when they'll talk. That's when they'll open up. And if you are living a hurried life, you will miss some of the most important, valuable, precious opportunities to pour into the lives of others. And so often I find myself, even at a conference like this, going from point A to point Z, and I'm going in a straight line, and anything between here and me is in my way and better get out of the way. And I'm embarrassed to tell you that, but that's kind of how we're wired to think. Always running late, no margin, no time. And so we miss the woman with the issue of blood who comes pressing through the crowd and just wants to get some life, some health. Because we're on our way to Jairus' house. But Jesus was able to stop and be all there and in the moment and to minister to people not on the run. Godliness and intimacy are not cultivated on the run. They require time and meditation and focused attention. There are no shortcuts to spiritual maturity. There are no shortcuts to being spiritually well-fed. You know that old hymn, we don't sing it much anymore because we don't understand its lifestyle that it's talking about. Take time to be holy. The world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. He leads me beside still waters. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Sheep don't know when they need to rest. They don't know that they need to rest. And often we're that way, and that's why they need a shepherd. And that's why we need a shepherd. We have a shepherd who makes us lie down in green pastures. And I'm learning that if I won't let him lead me there, sometimes he will make me lie down in green pastures. He has ways of stopping us. I've been dealing for the first time in 47 years with some back and shoulder issues. And I want to tell you what, the Lord has been making me lie down. I'm not just literally and physically, but he's got my attention. And he's been saying some things and doing some things in my own heart that are coming out of him having to make me lie down in those green pastures. Jesus' disciples had to learn this. When Jesus first selected the 12, Mark 3 tells us he chose them first that they might be with him. Just to be with him. Then that he might send them out to minister to others. That's not the way we do it in most of our churches. We get people saved and baptized and teach in a Sunday school class right away many times. Before they've been grounded, before they've been matured, before they've been with Jesus. And you say, well, I've, I know the word, I've been grounded, I've been matured. You know what? Every time I go out to minister, I need to be spending time first with Jesus. Filling up on him before you head into your day to minister to your children or in your workplace or in your ministry environment. First, he chose them to be with him. Just with him. It doesn't say what they were doing. It doesn't sound very productive as we measure productivity. What do you write in your, in your day timer? Be with Jesus? Yeah. Put it in your day timer if you need to. Be with him. So nobody else may be impressed at what you're doing with that time. But I'm telling you what, God is showing me that if I do not have fullness of heart before I go out and give out to others, I don't have a ministry. I may have an organization, but I don't have a ministry. Others may be impressed for a while, but if I don't get replenished and get with him, then I'm just giving them, I'm filling their notebooks, but I'm not filling their hearts. It's Christ who gives life. It's Christ who is the living water. It's Christ who is the bread of heaven, the bread of life. And I've got to be with him to get filled with him so that I have something to give to others. And then after we've poured into others' lives, we need to come back to him to get replenished. Mark chapter 6 tells us in verse 30, the apostles returned to Jesus after a ministry trip, a time of active ministry, and they told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, well, go out again. Not yet. What did he say? Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. 
He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside waters of rest. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. Isn't it interesting that God supplies that detail? Do you think God knew about the 21st century when the scripture was written? Of course he did. You think he knew that we'd be a generation just eating on the run, doing everything on the fly, sometimes not even having time to eat, so we're just gulping down our, you know, milkshake with all the nutrients in it, or you know, just no time for meals, no time to sit down. No t- of course he knew. So he called them, come away by yourselves with me to a desolate place. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. They had poured into others' lives. Now they needed to get refilled. They needed to get replenished. And it's in those quiet times, those quiet places with the Lord that we get replenished so that we're able to go back out and face the needy crowds again. And we need it again and again and again. Now Palestine, the land that David would have been familiar with as a shepherd himself, and knowing sheep in those and their needs, uh, the land of Palestine is a, it's an arid, barren desert land. It's not easy to find green pastures and still waters. But a good shepherd knew how to find them. A good shepherd knew where to take his sheep at different times of the year, at different times of the day, to find what they would need. And aren't you glad that we, has a, that we have a shepherd who knows how to find those places for us. You may have five children, homeschooling, hectic schedule, busy season of life. Your husband may be involved in a ministry startup or in your workplace, the demands of work and ministry combined. And you just say, it's hard to find waters of rest at this season of my life. That's why we have to follow the shepherd. That's why we've got to stay close to him. He's the one who will lead us to those places. He makes me lie down beside still waters. Lie down beside still waters. Some of us don't even have a clue what that means. Moms, lie down. It means being still in your heart. And to be still, you have to stop moving. Now, I want to say you can get a quiet heart even while you're doing some other things. And as a mom, it may be while you're nursing that infant in the middle of the night hours. It may be while you're doing some of those household responsibilities. Maybe your hands are active, but your heart is still. Getting quiet before the Lord. Stopping. You know, the pace of the average person today, doing everything on the run. Swenson says in his book, The Overload Syndrome, he says, even the best crew can't fix a race car when it's going 200 miles per hour. (laughs) Neither can our bodies perform needed repairs in the midst of a hyper-living lifestyle. And some of us are going to run our cars into the ground. And I want to tell you, I'm speaking to myself in this session. I need this passage. I need this text. I need those green pastures. I need to lie down and be still beside those waters of rest to get my soul replenished. You can't get the needed rest and refreshing on the run or an occasional few minutes snatched here and there. I'm amazed how many people, their quiet time consists of turning on the radio on their way to work. And I've been there. I know what it is to live in those fast food drive throughs spiritually speaking. I've known what it is also to be spiritually malnourished, to run on fumes, to run my car into the ground. And maybe you know that. And you know it doesn't work. Be still and know that I am God. Take time to be holy. It takes time to get replenished, time to get refreshed, time to be restored, time to get fed, time to be refueled. And not just once, and not just occasionally, but we need it in some fashion regularly. Even as your car needs regular tune-ups, regular fuel, regular oil checks. And I've just told you more than I know about cars. (laughs) But I know it. There's a sticker on the windshield that says every so many thousand miles and 
All I know is when it hits those thousand miles, I know where to pull it in to get somebody to check it. I do that with my car. Why don't we do it with our souls, with our bodies, with our hearts? You know what? So many of us wait till we've had the meltdown. We wait till we've cratered. We wait till the car is destroyed. Do it before you crater. Don't wait until you've gone into this hyper-stressed mode that Swenson talks about in his book, Hyper Living. You know, this way of living should be a way of living. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside waters of rest. Now, that's not all there is to this life. And in the next two sessions, we'll see more of this life of a sheep with our shepherd. But it's a crucial part, a way of life, getting our souls replenished. In the last couple of years, I've made a couple of changes that have, been, have made a huge difference in my own life. And I'm not standing before you here to say that I have no more stress. I actually, I've had more stress come into my life since starting these practices. But these are helping to balance out my life. And I'm not telling you to do it this way, but I'm telling you what's been hugely helpful for me. Number one is I started um, within the last couple of years taking computer-free Sundays. Now, for you, that may not be a big deal. You may not live on the computer, but my life is like it's, there's an umbilical cord between me and my computer, and it's all the time, hours and hours and hours. That's where I'm doing my studying. That's where I'm leading the ministry, working on email, working on projects, writing books, etc. and I started within the last couple of years, Saturday night when I'm done my work day, I turn off that computer and don't turn it back on until Sunday morning. Uh, until uh, Monday. <laughs> that was big of me. <laughs> until Monday morning. And it's been huge. Now, I was, in a way, practicing the Sabbath before I would be in church on Sunday and be taking time on the Lord's Day to do things centered around the church. But then I would go back to work late afternoon or evening and I could still get in a good shift of work and say that I'd taken a day off. God wired us to need a Sabbath. Now, in your life in ministry, Sunday may not be the day that you're able to do that. But for me, it's been a huge thing to take that one day a week, 36 hours or so, shut down in terms of my normal work and routine. I've started within the last year. Um, it's something that my board challenged me to, and it's been a huge gift from the Lord. And that is spending quality, extended time alone with the Lord in the morning before I check email. <laughs> now, again, for you, that may not be a big deal because you may not be into email. But email was running my life, and it was becoming a huge distraction in my relationship with the Lord. And I would have my quiet time, but if I started just checking my email first, seeing what had come in from the office, what I needed to do, sending someone else, you know, then by the time I got to the Word, I didn't have a quiet heart anymore. I wasn't sensitive to the Lord, and starting my day that way has been huge. We live in a world of constant interruptions, constant distractions, cell phones always going off, email ever-present, uh, pagers beeping, and all sorts of things you know what you need time in your life when you turn off all your electronics you need time when you turn off your radio turn off your television turn off your cd player turn off your ipod fa uh, your, your, uh, your ipod player in our conferences revive our hearts conferences we s challenge people from friday night when the conference ends session ends until saturday when the conference ends to take a media fast now all that means is from the time friday night session is over until saturday morning we say don't turn on your radio, don't turn on your TV, don't turn on, on your computer if you can help it. And you can't imagine what a huge deal that is for some people. You know what that means? It means we're in trouble. It means we're addicted. We need those periodic times of just being quiet. Short breaks within the course of a day to recenter, to refocus, to get replenished. We can't be cramming every waking moment with activity and conversation. We need time for reflection, time to think, time to be with the Lord and listen to him. That means we have to examine our schedules and our lifestyles. And I find I have to do this repeatedly. And those of you who are moms, wives, it means you need to do this for your family. I see families who are loving the Lord, serving the Lord, but they are running around like crazy people with schedules and ball games and practices and sports and plays and piano practice and music lessons, good things. 
But what are you teaching your children? Do they really need all of that? And are you getting them hooked on a rushed, hurried lifestyle that one, doesn't allow them to be children, and two, teaches them to be adults who never know how to be still? Do your children know how to be still? Can they be quiet? Can they be five minutes without something to do? You say, I can't get a quiet time because I've got children. Listen, when your children are pretty young, they can be taught to be still, to read or play quietly in their room while mom spends time with the Lord. Your children need to learn this. It may mean making some tough choices, but I'm telling you what, if we don't, we end up frazzled and frenetic and frantic and frustrated. Martha, bossing the Lord around. Lord, tell my sister to come in and help me. <laughs> Just a pressure cooker life. And when the lid blows off, whew, everybody get out of the way, right? And we got so many Christian women today who are angry stressed out of, off the charts. I said to someone last night, and I was talking about this tendency in my own life, and I said, I just don't think this brings glory to God for us to live this way. But you've got to be intentional about getting to those green pastures and those places of quiet rest. Now, I'm not talking about being lazy. I'm not talking about shirking responsibility. I'm not talking about making an easy, comfortable, convenient life for yourself. We are called to be diligent. We are called to be soldiers. We are warriors. But I am talking about ordering your life around the Lord. Putting first things first. Getting your soul nourished and fit so you can be ready for the battle. Are you getting time to be quiet and still, to rest before him? Is your spirit getting fed? Is it getting nourished? The Lord in recent weeks has been bringing me back over and over again. It's like everywhere I turn, the Lord puts this verse in front of me. So I guess he knows I need it. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. Come to me. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's what we experience when we're following the shepherd. I quoted George Mueller in the last session. He said in his autobiography, this is this man who had such huge responsibilities caring for all these orphans in uh, Bristol, England. He said, above all things, see to it that your souls are happy in the Lord. Above all things. He says, other things may press upon you. The Lord's work may even have urgent claims upon your attention, but I deliberately repeat, it is of supreme importance and it is of supreme and paramount importance that you should seek above all things to have your souls truly happy in God himself. He said, "Day by day, seek to make this the most important business of your life." And isn't that what our world needs to see? Isn't that what your children need to see? A mom, a woman, a wife, a woman of God whose soul is happy in the Lord. That is the greatest witness. Well, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside waters of rest. And then verse 3, he restores my soul. I love that verse. He restores my soul. You know why I love it? Because I need it. Over and over and over again. Somebody who heard that I was uh, teaching on this this week sent me an email and um, shared with me a paraphrase from, uh, from a paraphrase that's been written on this verse. It says, he revives my drooping head. <laughs> I like that. He revives my drooping head. He restores my soul. That word restore used in the Old Testament Hebrew used many times. It means to turn back, to turn around, to return, to refresh, to revive. The, the basic meaning of this word is a movement back to the place of departure. He brings me back to the place where I left that intimacy with my shepherd. And he restores us. It suggests that we need to be restored. Why would he have to restore us if we didn't need to be restored? We have to humble ourselves enough to say, Lord, I do need for my soul to be restored. 
the shepherd that David, he understood about sheep and shepherds, and he knew that when his sheep were hungry or tired, he would need as a shepherd to find refreshing for them, food and water and a place to rest. And he knew sometimes they need to be restored in a different sense. When they had strayed off, when they had wandered off from the flock, they would need to be brought back, brought back to the place of departure, restored. And so we need to be restored in those two different senses. First, when we are weak and fainting, we need to be restored. And second, when we are wayward and failing. When we are weak and fainting, and when we are wayward and failing, we need to be restored. Think about those two times for just a moment here. First, when we're weak and fainting. And I think there are two things that cause us to be weak and fainting. First is, first is when we have served others when we've been pouring ourselves out on behalf of others. We need to be revived. Our our hands and hearts get drooping. We need to be revived, restored. We get uh, depleted. We need our reserves replenished. We need to get refueled. I've taken time just recently to go away and I I couldn't be away from my computer. I had some deadlines I had to meet, but just to a quiet place to do it for several days with a beautiful view and to get my soul replenished. He uses his word to restore our souls. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. Same word, he restores my soul. And not only when we have served others, but when we have suffered, when we've been through difficult times. And I love that verse in 1 Peter 5 that says, after you have suffered a little while, it may seem like a long while, but it really is in light of eternity, just a little while. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore. He will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. He restores my soul. When I am weak and uh, fainting, and when I am wayward and failing. When we are wayward and failing, when we have sinned, when we have strayed, when we have stumbled as those sheep would have a tendency to wander away from the flock, to get lost. And then when that sheep would get lost, when darkness would fall on the land, that little lamb was in danger. He would be an easy prey for the wild animals. He might fall off a cliff. So when the shepherd would discover that one of his lambs was missing, he would go out and look for that sheep. And when he found it, he would put it on his shoulders and carry it back to the flock. He restores my soul. David understood this. He had had that experience with Bathsheba when he had been wayward, sinful, shamefully so. And he prayed in Psalm 51, O Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation. He restores my soul, and aren't you thankful if we had to live with the guilt and the shame of our failures, we would always be drooping and fainting and failing. But he restores, he forgives when we come in brokenness and repentance before him. He restores our souls. He restores us to usefulness. He restores us to fruitfulness. He restores the joy of our salvation. You may have sinned willfully or overtly, or you may just have left your first love, just wandered off, drawn by other things, you need to be restored. Aren't you glad that he pursues, that he goes looking for us when we need to be restored? There's no hopeless situation. It's not too late. And we know that he uses chastening to restore us to a place of obedience. He uses his word, his spirit, but he also uses discipline. But I'm so thankful that he can fully restore the years that the locusts have eaten. He can, and he does. Does your soul need to be restored? That may be why you've come to this conference this week. And we all need that. Not just once, not just periodically, but regularly. Times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. Acts 3 says, we need refreshing. Get to him. Come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden. Not necessarily vacations or music or entertainment or medication or therapy. You may need a vacation, but I'm telling you what, sometimes I've taken a vacation and come back more exhausted than before I went. (laughs) Because it's not just the external that needs to be restored. It's the innermost part of my heart that only the presence of Christ can restore. 
You can do all those other things and still have soul weariness. Restoration is found in a person, the shepherd of our souls. And then once restored, he helps us to go on. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness or in right paths for his name's sake. You know it's true that left to ourselves, we will end up on wrong paths. We will get lost. We need his guidance. He leads us by his word. Someone was just telling me before the session that she went off hiking on the grounds here this afternoon and she looked at her watch and realized she had to be back in 15 minutes and realized she had not a clue where she was. <laughs> Out on one of these trails and now, I would never get into that position because I'm so scared of being lost that I don't venture off very far if I'm alone, but she's more adventurous than I am. And she said she realized she had no idea where she was and she came to a fork in the road, had no idea, do I go left or do I go right? And um, she said just at that point, someone came along who knew the grounds. She said to him, could you tell me which way to go? And he pointed her in the right direction. Aren't you glad we have the word of God? It's a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. We have the Spirit of God living within us to lead us, to guide us in the ways of God. Now, if we're not following him and experiencing these first three verses we've already talked about, finding green pastures, finding rest in still waters, having our soul restored, letting him lead us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. If we're not experiencing that and following him in that path, then we will have difficulty trusting him when we get to the valleys of deep darkness, which we'll talk about in the next session. And let me say to you that it says here he will lead us in right paths. Those are paths that he knows are right. They aren't always the paths that seem right to us. They're not always the paths we would choose. If we were drawing the map, if we were writing the script, they're not always the ways we would choose. Who would choose cancer? Who would choose bankruptcy? Who would choose to get fired from your church position? Who would choose to have a child who is wayward, a prodigal son or daughter? Who would choose these things. It's not that God delights in making life difficult for us, but he knows what it's going to take to make us come forth as gold. He knows the right paths for us. He knows what it's going to take for us to become like Jesus. The paths of righteousness, right paths, they don't always seem right. They can be hard paths. Those paths may lead you into the furnace as they did those three Hebrew young men. His paths may lead you into the desert as God led the Old Testament Jews into the wilderness when they came out of Egypt. And as he led his own son into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil for 40 days. Who led Jesus there? The Spirit of God. But it was a right path. He leads me in right paths. He may lead you into the valley of deep darkness, the valley of the shadow of death. But if he leads you there, then it will be for you a right path. And when it's hard, and when you can't see your hand in front of your face for the fog or the darkness, know that if he led you there, he will walk you through it. We'll talk about that more in the next session. If he led you there, it's a right path fulfilling his eternal purposes. And what's the purpose? He leads me in the right paths for his name's sake. For the glory of his name. And ladies, we have to come to the point where we care more about his sake and his name than our own. Lord, if it pleases you, it pleases me. If this is for your glory and for your name's sake, then it's what I choose. You see, we exist for God. He doesn't exist for us. And our reason for living is to bring glory to his name. The God of the universe does not exist in order to save your broken marriage or in order to get you out of debt or in order to get your congregation to like you better or in order to help you cope with stress. 
God is not this, you know, magic genie bottle that you just, you know, he just comes out and makes all our problems disappear. He does not exist to serve us. We exist to glorify him. Not to get him to meet our needs or to get him to do what we want him to do. Scripture says all things are of him and from him and for him and to him. All things, even your pressures, even your problems, it's all for him. It's for his name's sake. And what if God will be more glorified by my life having hard places, but people seeing that I trust my shepherd in the midst of the hard places, and God is glorified and other people are drawn to the shepherd. What if that brings God glory? Can I say, Lord, then yes, I will walk in those paths. I will let you lead me to that hard place. Everything in heaven and on earth revolves around him. He is the son of our universe. And that's the perspective we need as we walk in these paths. And remembering that the way we live, the way we respond to pressure, the way we respond to heartache, the way we respond to the fiery furnace and to the desert, the way we respond in the valley of deep darkness is always proclaiming what we believe about God. It was John Wesley who said, our job is to give the world a right opinion of God. And one of the things that saddens me so deeply, if I have any regrets in my life to this point, it's the number of times when my response to hardship did not give a right impression of God. When people would have looked at my life and thought, she's got a hard taskmaster. I don't know that I'd want to serve him. Oh, he is an incredible Lord and lover and leader and God. I know that in my heart. So in the hard times, how can I proclaim him to be the great shepherd that he is? His reputation is at stake. The way I respond reflects on him. So let him choose the right paths for you. And be careful about comparing with the paths that he chooses for someone else. Lord, that woman over there, all those people over there, why did they, their lives seem so easy. They don't have to go through this. And some of you are going through things that most of us will never experience. You know what? Let him choose the path for you. And his grace will be tailor-made to the path that he chooses for you. There have been times, I confess, when I have wondered deeply, is this really a right path? thought I'd been following the Lord. I believed that I had been, but it seemed so hard. I wondered, am I really supposed to be here? And is he here with me? I want to tell you, looking back, I can see now that his paths, his choices for me have always, always, always been right. And I only have a glimpse of that now. But in heaven, we will look back and we will say, Lord, you did all things well. It was Fanny Crosby who wrote that hymn that's become such a treasure to the church in her blindness, in her weakness, in her difficulty. She needed a shepherd. and She said, all the way, my Savior leads me. Cheers each winding path I tread. Gives me grace for every trial feeds me with the living bread. Though my weary steps may falter and my soul of thirst may be, gushing from the rock before me, lo, a spring of joy I see. All the way my Savior leads me, oh, the fullness of his love. Perfect rest to me is promised in my Father's house above. Perfect rest is until then. Rest now perfect rest then. When my spirit, clothed immortal, wings its flight to realms of day, this my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside waters of rest. He restores my soul. And then he leads me in paths of righteousness, right paths, for his name's sake. Let's thank him.
And Father, we just want to bless you and say thank you for leading us where you know we need to go. Help us to trust your heart. And for some who may be walking right now on hard paths, pray that you would strengthen and encourage them, give them hope for the journey and confidence that you are leading. You are there. You will point out the next step, and that's all we need. Thank you for being a great, great shepherd. And we want to say we love you and we trust you.